Hello everyone, um, in this video I'm going to be making a um, comprehensive review of the 2016 exam. So if you haven't done this exam yet, this is a perfect time to kind of just pause your video as I go along. I've essentially made a blank exam here. Um, I have the questions that are pretty much almost entirely blank except for the reaction sections. The reaction section is the one section where you should be fully ready for. I shouldn't have to like show every single step. It's it's old news, nothing really new. Um, I'll go over it, but I'm not gonna like write out every step. I'm just gonna go along with the key. Um, but aside from that section, every other section I'm going to do, and um, it should be pretty much like a blank exam. So if you wanna do it with me, that's perfect. Uh, it's a great time to learn. So um, starting from nomenclature, it seems from the exam, there are uh, three nomenclature questions for a total of uh, nine points. Three points each. Um, so let's start. Uh, let's get into it. First one is a chair confirmation of a cyclohexane. All right. So regardless of where I start, I'm always going to get the same numbering. So one, two, three, four. Or if I start over here, it's going to be one, one, two, three, four. So regardless of where you start, it's always going to be a one or four. So the, the choice is I have to figure out which one's which one's going to be my one. Is it going to be this one over here? Or is it going to be uh, this one over here? So I have to make a strategic decision about which one's going to be the one. And that's um, since numbers aren't going to let me choose. I, the, the longest chain is not consideration here. It's going to be strictly jump to alphabetical ordering. So here I have an ethyl group. Over here I have a 1, 2, 3, 4. So there's a propyl group. 2, 3, 4. Yes. Propyl group. So um, E comes before P. That means I'm going to start my 1 over here. My four over here. Okay, let me just check their key. All right, so one ethyl. So we're good. We're on the right track. So one ethyl and some four propyl whatever. Okay. So um, let's just name this. Let's start naming the pieces. One ethyl, and then I have four. Okay, four, and I'm put parentheses because I have a substituent on a substituent. So I have one, two, three, four, and on number three, I have a methyl group. So four, three, methyl, propyl. Okay, and then cyclohexane. All right, and then I'm missing something. Right, so these groups have stereochemical, um, uh, really they're related stereochemically. So, um. This group on the top over here, because I, I drew these myself. Yes, yeah, so this one should be the axial position, right? It's very clearly axial. So this is the axial position. This is the equatorial position. Um, the easy way is to kind of just look at them and see, is are they both going in the upwards direction or is one going downwards and another one going more upwards? So here it looks like they're both going upwards. I'm going to say they're cis. And the answer shows they are cis. So that's the very easy way of always getting it right. So I have to add cis at the front of my name. So cis one ethyl four uh four three methylpropyl. Cis one ethyl four three methylpropyl cyclohexane. Very good. All right. So easy enough. Let's move on to the next one. Um, uh, next one I have to add some things. And I'm pretty sure this is a hydrogen. Let me just check. Yes, it is. All right. Um, so this is a, a, my molecule. Now, my rules are I need to have the longest chain that uh, includes the, the the highest priority substituent, which for us is alcohols. And um, I need to get that alcohol in the quickest position, right? So I know I'm cheating, but um, just to check whether I'm about to say the right thing or not. Um, so, you know, pause the video if you want to do it and move along with me and, and just unpause when you're ready to go. So my chain, so I have I have different substituents. I have this alcohol group, I have this ring, right? And then I have the chain. So the first thing to notice is that the ring, even though it looks like it's like coming off here, right? This is a step this ring is a substituent of this carbon right here. Okay. This ring is a substituent of this carbon right here. So what I'm trying to get at is that I can number this one, right? And if I number this one, I get to the alcohol group faster than if I start on this direction. You can obviously see it's a lot more carbons, 
So I always want to get to my highest priority group as fast as possible. Okay. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, so I already found the right direction to go. And so instead of going this direction, I want to go this direction, all right? And so on one, I have a cyclo pentyl. Okay, three, I have the alcohol. That's where the, the all is. And then um, on seven, I have the ene. Okay, and then on three, I have some stereochemistry that's indicated, so I need to find the RNS for that. So let's do that quickly. All right, so alcohol is going to be one, right? And if I'm comparing chains, right, so now I have two carbon chains, so I need to look further down the carbon. So carbon is a CH2, this is a CH2. Okay, that's fine, that's the same and same. So I need to look down one more. This is a CH2, this is also a CH2, okay? This is a car is a CH bond to two other carbons. This one over here is still a CH2. So I'm going to get to the heavier side this direction faster than if I went in this direction. So it takes me one, two, and then on the third one, that's where I have two carbons attached. And then one, two, on the third one, I still only have one carbon attached. So this is going to be three, and this is four. All right, so I'm going in the... Okay, so this is the S direction, but because my fourth group is on the, the wedge, it becomes R. So I have 3R. All right, and don't forget your E and Z, and do we have E and Z? We do not, because at the end of this double bond, I have two hydrogens, and remember, to have E and Z, I have to have two distinct and different groups they're on each uh, each side of the of the bond. So this H and H, they are not comparable. I can't I can't say oh which one is heavier, which one's uh, lighter. I can't do that. Okay, and they're both hydrogens. So my name is going to be all right. So at the beginning of my molecule, I put three R, and then I start naming alphabetically. So I have only one substituent, which is the the ring. So one cyclopentyl. Okay, and then I, I have my parent. So my parent is a octane, oct octanol, so, but it also has a double bond in it. So cyclopentyl, okay, oct, okay, oct, seven, en, three, all. All right, so three R, one cyclopentyl, oct, seven, E N three all. Alright? So this is the right answer. Three R. So I always put the number. If you only have one of something, you don't have to put the number because it's obviously it should be understood from whoever is doing this. So three R, one cyclopentyl, seven, oct, and I didn't put the seven in between the substitute and the parent. I put it in the front so I don't have this dash here, which is fine. I just jump to the parent and then oct seven e and three all. So that's perfectly fine. All right, and now for the last one. Okay, so um, first things first, I my rules are, so when it comes to double bonds, triple bonds, they have equal priority. So that means I'm just, I'm just trying to maximize as many as I can in a single chain. So I clearly see that this chain right here is the parent. It has the, mo it has the most substituents in it. And so now all I'm doing is I'm trying to find the direction that um, is better, okay? So um, I can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is two, seven, if I go this direction. And if I go this direction, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay? So it's still seven, two, seven. Um, so I think, the way this works is if you have um, same numbering, obviously now we have to go to alphabetical. So um, when it, when it's at this point, the double bond has priority over the triple bond. Okay, and let me check the key just to make sure. And if I check the key, yes, I am right. Right. So alkene versus alkyne. So this the double bond has priority over the triple bond if in this in a situation like this. 
So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. And now it's pretty easy from here to, to name it. So let's just number this guy. One, two, three. All right. Not bad. And now let's do this. All right. So I have on two, I have a double bond, and on seven, I have a triple bond. Okay, and my and I only have one substituent. Um, so I have a propyl group. So on three, I have three propyl. Okay, and am I missing something before I go on? So remember, whenever we have internal double bonds, so never terminal. When I have internal double bonds, I have to check if I have E or Z. So I do have E and Z here. I have this hydrogen group. I have this R group. So these are two different uh, sides. I can compare them. And then I have this whole group and I have a propyl group. So these are two different sides and I can compare them. And now I have to do, um, I have to label them heavy and light. So what we do is I'm comparing the individual ends of each of the double bonds. So, you know, whether it's the left or left or right side or the top and bottom, I'm comparing the two groups that are coming off of the same carbon, right? I'm comparing them. So the left side over here compared to this this top right side, top left side versus top right side, which one's heavier? Well, I can clearly see uh, eventually I'm going to get to a CH3, which is the, you know, the end. But over here I keep going and eventually, you know, by my third carbon, one, two, three, I have multiple uh, bonds, okay? So I have another carbon bond here. So this is going to be heavy. It follows the same rules as R and S, you know, we're looking at the the the, the weight. Case is heavy. This is light. Okay, can't really draw. And then comparing a carbon versus hydrogen, that's obvious. Heavy versus light. And so we see our our heavy and lights are on the same side. So same side. So that means I have a uh, uh, a Z. Okay, so. I have a Z over here. So I have two Z. Two Z, right? Three purple, and then the rest of the name of the chain. So two Z, three purple. And since I just go to the, the actual chain, it's nine, lo nine long, so it's known, known, right? And then, um, so, the the higher priority group is the the double bond, so I believe that's going to be the final thing. So known seven y n, and then two in, and so I think that's the logic that we use in this case. And okay, let's see. Do they put that last? Hmm. It's very rare that uh, that you have this, but um, oh wait, my bad, my bad. I think uh, alphabetically, I think it maybe it goes by alph alphabetical order. So two e n seven, and sometimes you know, honestly, I can't say for sure um, why this is coming before. Um, it might be actually the alphabetical component of it, but but this is her key. So if you do have a situation like this, it's not like oh crap, Amen doesn't know what to do. Uh, here's here's what we do. So if you have a situation like this, just put the Y N E part last. If you have the double bond and triple bond in the same parent chain, okay. So if there's no alcohols, no confusion about it. Always put double bond first in the parent, then triple bond, okay. And if you had alcohol, you would put that last, obviously, because it's the highest priority. So that's it for nomenclature. These are the three names. Let's quickly move on. All right. So the first problem is when dibromo compound is dissolved in methanol, one of the bromine atoms is rapidly substituted with a methoxy group. Is the bromine atom on carbon A or carbon B substituted faster? All right. So we have carbon A. We have carbon B. Right, and her question is for us um, when this is dissolved in 
methanol, right? And she's saying it's substituted with a methoxy group. This is a methoxy, methoxy, right? R O C H three, and she's saying which one is substituted faster, right? And when when these are substituted, so essentially what we're doing is we're looking at um, a situation when A is being substituted and comparing it to the sub uh, situation when B is being substituted. So let's look at both of these, okay? So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to paste it. Boom. All right. So in the situation where A, first things first, what kind of reaction is this? I have a leaving group. They're both secondary. And I have a weak nucleophile slash weak base. So this is SN1. And in SN1, the leaving group just leaves. So let's say I make the leaving group just leave for A, and I get a carbocation. Right, and I have this bromine group still here, and then for the other one, I'm going to make this one leave. So this is A, and this is B, okay, and then for this one, I'm gonna keep this here, bromine, and then this one left, and I got a carbocation right here. Now, quick concept review for this, okay. Um. When I'm doing, oh God, when I'm doing this, um, I am, the whole concept by, uh, for SN1 and E1, the whole thing that's determining this is based on um, the ability of the carbocation to form, right? If the carbocation cannot form, then I can't have this reaction progressing very, uh, very well. Like I won't get good yield. So if I can't have the carbocation forming, aka if it's not stabilized, right? Because it's not going to form. I'm not going to form something unstable. The leaving group is not going to leave unless you know what's left behind is stabilized, right? So that's why it's a slow step. The slow step is the formation of the carbocation. It's the rate determining step. That's what this means, right? So I'm looking at how stable can this carbocation be. So comparing A and B which carbocation is going to be more stable? And that's going to tell us which one is going to be substituted faster, aka the faster reaction, right? And that is the faster reaction because this carbocation exists more likely, and therefore it's going to be substituted more likely. I hope that makes sense. So if I look over this, it's very simple. This is a, a carbocation that is able to resonate with the benzene ring. So because I have resonance here, this helps stabilize this carbocation. However, I have nothing over here. So that's the that's the answer. So the answer is A. Okay, A is going to be substituted faster because this carbocation exists um, for more periods of time than this one can, or will form more likely than this one can. Okay, so that's that's the concept behind that one. The answer is A. All right, I'm going to jump to number three, and then I'll do number two in a second. Consider the substituted cyclohexane below. In the more stable con chair conformation, how many methyl groups are in equatorial position? All right, so let's quickly, um, what's, the, what's the fast way of doing this? The fast way of doing this that I've taught before is I'm, here I don't have a, a largest group, right? I have to be kind of, I have to think a little bit. I don't have a largest group that I can just jump to and be like, ah, I want that to be equatorial. No, I don't have that. So, um, what I have to do is I have to kind of be strategic and think about how I want uh, to do this. Okay, so for the for these for these positions, I need to I need to see just simply how many groups can I get in equatorial, All right? And it's likely that I want the biggest. These are still the biggest groups, so I probably want them to be equatorial because they're going to contribute most of the total energy of the of whatever chair they're in. So. A few tricks, okay. When I am, um, when I have groups that are opposite, okay. When I have groups that are opposite, um, this means that they will be the same, right? So if they're an opposite wedge and dash, and they're on the completely opposite side of the of the ring, aka one, two, three, so uh, th three away they are going to be uh, on, on the same. So if I say this is equatorial, then light wedge over here is going to be axial. 
then the light wedge over here is going to, uh, I mean, the dash is going to be here um, equatorial again. And then the, the dash over here is going to be axial and the dark wedge is going to be equatorial. So you see how they, if, I, if they're on opposite wedge and dash on the opposite sides of the ring, they will be the same uh, um, stereochemical orientation. So both are equatorial. And that's really good. Okay. So I'm just going to um, get rid of all of this crap. All right. So this is equatorial as well. So I'm already, I'm already seeing that this is a good, this is a good setup for my chair. So if this is equatorial. We said this is a CH3 group is axial. And if this is equatorial, that means this is axial. So if I, this is the most stable chair, this is two equatorial positions. Okay. And now let's check the key. Uh, so the answer is, oh, zero. Let's see. Interesting. That might be because if I chose the other one, hmm. let's see, let's see. All right, if I choose, let me, let me draw in red. Interesting. Is that, is that possible? In the more steel chain, let me show me. Oh, how many methyl groups? Okay, my bad. How many methyl groups? So I that's a that's stupid. So how many methyl groups are in equatorial? Oh, we said zero. So the answer is uh, zero methyl groups. All right. So zero methyl groups are in the equatorial position. So that's that's that for that questions. All right. So now let's go back to number two. All right. So this is just R and S and just figure out the relationship. Are they identical structural? Uh, or enantiomers or diastereomers. I know right away they can't be diastereomers because diastereomers require at least two chiral centers. I only have one chiral center, chiral center H. Now the check if they're structural. I have CH3, I have an H, I have an OH, I have CH2BR, I have an H, OH, CH2BR, CH3. So I have the same groups that are bonded to the same chiral center. So um, I have the same connectivity, the same molecular formulas. Um, so they are isomers of each other potentially, right? Now to check if they're um, check if they are uh, identical or not. Um, <clears throat> structural isomers is when I have um, different connectivity, but the same molecular formula. Okay, um, identical is when they are the exact same RNS. Enantiomers are when they are completely flipped. All the chiral centers are flipped from let's say R to S or S to R. Everything is flipped. Diastereomers is when if I have let's say R and R, and on the other one, we see that it's R and S. This would be a diastereomer. Okay, so let's check now. Um, so this is going to be one, this is one, and I can just tell you right now this is two, this is two, three, three, four. All right. So one, two, three in this direction. Hydrogen is on the the horizontal position. This would be R S. And then this is one, two, three, so oops, be daisy. So this is R. Okay? So I have S and then I have R. So these are enantiomers. Okay? Enantiomers. So the answer is correct. All right. Um, so now let's look at the next one here. Um, consider the resonance contributors below. And the question is, place the contributors in order of increasing importance to the hybrid. So which one, which, which one of these is the most important to the hybrid structure? And that means like which one is essentially the one that is most stable and therefore exists the most uh, in the hybrid. Uh, not exists the most, but uh, contributes the most. Okay, so the one that's most stable will contribute the most to what the hybrid is. All right, so um, over here I have this molecule. Its resonance is, um, we have resonance into the oxygen. So it goes like this. Arrow goes towards the oxygen. And then this one comes over here. Okay, and then the last one is, um, let's see, 
And the last one is simply just uh, when this when this went into the oxygen, and um, and then uh, I, I had the carbocation right here. So these are all just resonance uh, structures of each other, and I'm just essentially looking at. Um, all right, so we're just looking at which one of these is most stable. So this is an oxygen, right, uh, with the positive charge. The first things first, what's the most important uh, thing when we're looking at resonance structures and figuring out which one's most stable? The most important thing is, do they have octet or not? And then we'll look at all the other factors of like where the charge is at and electronegativity of, you know, uh, how that plays a role. Um, so they all have octet. We need to make sure they have all, they all have octet. So this oxygen is where the charge is. Does it have octet? Yes, two, four, six, eight. So that's eight, it's fine. Uh, carbocation, this is not octet. Carbocation, this is not octet. So right away, right away, this is the most important, okay? So, just going to erase that. This is going to be three. Now, comparing this one versus this one, now it's just a, a matter of just comparing the degree, right? So for carbocations and for radicals, the rule is the more substituted carbon they are on, so it's tertiary is best, secondary is next, the better they are. So this is going to obviously be number uh, two, and this is going to be number one. So just three, two, one. Easy peasy, one, two, three, easy. And then she asks, place the hybridization of the, ox of the oxygen atom. And when we look at hybridization, we always look at the lowest hybridization um, that, that is possible. Uh, and all by and we have to consider all the resonance structures. So we choose the lowest hybridization out of all these structures. So the lowest hybridization is going to be this oxygen right here, that is uh, sp2, sp2 bound. So it has a double bond. And so this one, the hybridization of this one and this one are the same. And essentially, it's we have one group, two groups, three groups, four groups. So these are sp3. Okay, so this one and this one are sp3. This one right here is one groups, two groups, three groups. So this is sp2, okay? And if you don't know by now, it's simply s is one, p, p1 is, so this is, uh, this is two groups. So it's like, s would be triple bonds. So this carbon right here is bound to one group, two groups. So this would be sp. sp2 is double bonds. Right, so this carbon right here is bound to one group, two groups, three groups. So one, and then two, two, three. So that's a total of three. So two plus one, and then obviously SP3, you don't need me to say it, is four. So this carbon right here is bound to one, two, three, four. Most carbons are SP3. All right, so that should be simple enough. Um, the final question that I'm going to do uh, for this page is acidity. So she wants us to look at these uh, hydrogens and ask, and the question is, how acidic are they? Um, so this we have to compare this hydrogen to this hydrogen to this hydrogen. And essentially what we're going to be doing is we're going to be imagining if we took off one of the hydrogens, so I'll make this a two, and then we're adding the lone pair that, that, that occurs once we do that. So I'm taking this off, and I'm adding a lone pair there and a negative charge. And I'm, I'm looking at all these individually, okay? L let's imagine that they aren't all happening at the same time. I'm just putting them all up here. And I'm taking this off and I'm putting a lone pair right there and a negative charge. So I'm looking at, okay, which, which one of these is going to be stabilized the best? So the one that's going to be stabilized the best is the one that obviously... If we're going to consider uh, four things. So we have uh, we have atom, resonance, uh, inductive effects. So that's that's E, and then S is the last thing is just the hybridization. So S S S character, right? Uh, the higher the S character, the uh, the higher the acidity. Okay, but you don't need to know this. All right, that's for mainly the exam and orgo two. All right, so atom resonance, like uh, inductive effect. Resonance is, is probably one of the most important factors always. Um, 
but first we can we compare the atoms and normally it'll be it'll be always pretty easy to compare so they're all carbons so carbon 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 always they're all carbons here that's that's perfect um so we're not really looking at atoms we're looking at resonance here so first one is first this carbon right here do i have resonance no i do not i cannot move in over here this is fully octet so this is uh you know no resonance is possible here so this is automatically one right because this 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 uh this carbanion is not stabilized so a base an acid strength is directly correlated to how stable the conjugate base is so let me say that again an acid strength is directly correlated to how stable the conjugate base is so we're looking at how stable these these charges are this negative charge right here can resonate with this double bond and this would come out over here and I would get the negative charge over there. So I have a, a resonance structure that's going from one carbon with a negative charge and it's resonating to another carbon with a negative charge. Okay. And then I have this structure up here where I can have a, a resonance over here and then a resonance up here. So I'm resonating from a carbon with a negative charge to an oxygen with a negative charge. So this is a combination of both resonance and atom, and we're considering these factors. So these are both have one resonance, right? But the one on the top is resonate, resonating with an oxygen. So this is going to be far better because oxygen is the best at handling negative charges compared to a carbon in this situ uh, situation. And then over here, this is better than no resonance. So this is two. So this is the least acidic, this is the second most acidic, and this is by far the most acidic. Okay, and this is actually a very special uh, hydrogen location. When it's next to the carbonyl structure, when we have this hydrogen right here, these hydrogens, they're acidic hydrogens. That we'll, we'll look at this much, much later in Orgo 2. And they come in, to, they play a very important role. Alright, so just know that the hydrogen that's one away from the carbonyl uh, are acidic. All right. Moving on, and now let's look at this. So place the radicals in order of increasing stability. So we said radicals. We prefer them on tertiary and etc. So this is a this is a radical on a primary. This is a uh, radical on a primary. This is a radical on a essentially a zero methyl group. Okay. So um, what I have here is, so this is definitely the least stable, right? So zero, zero, uh, just a methyl group that's not stable at all. And then how do I know the two, uh, which one's better from among the two primaries? Well, this one has resonance, so I can have a half reaction that happens right there, and this will come out over here. So because this has resonance, this is three. This has no resonance, but it's at least one. So this is two, and our answer is going to be three, two, one. Okay, three, two, one. All right, now I'm going to do a, a little separate video on this, um, but this is something that she just taught last her last lecture. There's four, four that you have to identify with, with the mass spec. This one just happens to be iodine, um, but there's three others, okay? So you have to be able to identify sulfur, uh, chlorine, iodine, and bromine, and I'll go over it in another video, but th these are just the four that you need to be able to identify and know what their graphs look like on the mass spec chart. So iodine, what iodine looks like, it looks like this. Iodine, um, when it goes to the mass spec, it breaks off and it forms an I uh, I uh, iodonium, uh, uh, iodonium atom, okay? So, and so what this means is that if I have some molecule with an iodine on it and I put it into the mass spec machine, I will get a peak that is representative of this whole thing. So this is the parent peak right here. Okay. And then I will get a peak that after this breaks off, I will get an iodine with positive charge, which has a weight of 127. And so you will get the 127 peak always in mass spec. And so that's reflective right here. Okay, and then another indicator is that we have this, what she, she's written here, a gap of 127 mass units. So between the parent and the very next peak, 
is a gap of 127. So if I add 127 to this, it looks like 29 or whatever, I will get 156. All right. So we have 127 difference. So that just means that the, the this molecule right here is the thing that essentially just lost the iodine. So it's the whole thing minus the iodine, and that's what this one right here is. And so this is just how how the this graph makes sense. Okay. And so this is just one of the four that you need to be able to identify with, and I'll, and I'll show them very quickly um, in another video. All right, so not too bad. And she says uh, an unknown compound contains carbon, hydrogen, and one other element. So it's just a straight chain with an ID on it. So she says contains carbon, hydrogen, and one other element. What is that one other element? It is ID. Okay. Um, now the next one is carefully examine the spectrum and the compounds and the compounds below. Place a letter of the correct compound in the box. I couldn't really um, erase the answer, but it's whatever. So we have certain structures that uh, we need to be able to identify with, um, and 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 uh, the the best way to do this is just kind of to see to see what we have and then um, see the options that we're given and then look at the answers. Um, this one was, this one was actually kind of hard and I'm going to zoom in a bit, uh, cause it's kind of hard to see on mine. So it's not very good quality, but if you can see over here, uh, so first things we need to notice is that I have a very broad, um, alcohol stretch. All right. So this is very characteristic, broad alcohol stretch, right? Um, it's not completely smooth on this side, so that's kind of suspicious a bit. Um, and then I need to look at into this region. So I have this looks like the seventeen hundred region, and I have like two pretty pretty big peaks. That is like this is definitely not noise. Like this is a peak that is in like the sixteen fifty ish region, and it's a it's also next to like an, a significant like seventeen hundred peak. So that's kind of suspicious as well. So I need to take this information. She she already you can see the answer here already. So like, um, you know it's already clear to you. But when we look at what we have over here, um, I have something that's just a lone alcohol by itself, and then I have uh, a carbonyl, and then I have a carboxylic acid only, and then I have a alkene and a carboxylic acid, and then I have a uh which is not a carboxylic acid. Uh, I have alcohol, carbonyl, a ketone, and a uh, alkene. So this one has all three things. So how do I know which one is which? Well, let's, let's start eliminating some crappy choices. The crappiest choice out of all of these is C. Okay, C is most definitely the crappiest choice, and the reason for that is because if this was if this was a carboxylic acid only. I would have a very clean, very typical carboxylic acid peak where it's just a uh, broad, wide stretch, and then it has the the sharp uh, points at the ends, and then it's more, uh, you know, it goes up again. So this is kind of it doesn't look very characteristic of the carboxylic acid. It looks like something that, a little bit of a disturbance, maybe multiple functional groups as we clearly have. Um, so I would I would mark off C. Okay. A Markov C, and to a further explanation, reasoning for that is this: we have a double peak in the sixteen to seven uh, to eighteen hundred region, so that's also suspicious. Not common for her to do, but this is, you know, this is just the example in this case. Okay, um, so now let's look at the rest. The rest I have a alcohol, and then I have a carbonyl. The biggest giveaway for why A is not the right answer is um, because I do not have a, for one thing is I don't have a clean OH, OH stretch, right? This is pretty messy right here. Usually it's not merged with the, uh, it's not merged like this, right? And it's pretty, it's pretty far down. Normally it's more in this direction and then it's at 3000, not up and all the way into the 2000 region. It's kind of strange, okay? So it's extremely broad. Um, so I wouldn't really think that this is just a carboxylic acid and alkene. I, I would I would think that um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't think that I would have something like this uh, necessarily. Uh, I mean this is this is my answer. So I'm talking about uh, talking about A. 
So A, I wouldn't have this clean OH peak and then just the regular ketone. Um, I, I don't, I would not think like that. And then for D, why D is not the right one, um, I have a OH, I have a ketone, and I also have alkene. So like, it's just combining everything. So first things first, if I just had an irregular OH, I should have a clean OH peak, just like how I, I, proved, I said that A was wrong for that reason. So I should have a very clean OH stretch. And then I should have this, and this makes sense. So the two, the two peaks, that would make sense for this. But B is the only thing where it matches this kind of messy, messy stretch right here with the carboxylic acid group. And then um, this is the car carbonyl on the carboxylic acid. And then this is the alkene um, that's uh, presented here, the, the shallower peak. So it's kind of hard, and I kind of was rambling a bit, but um, I think B is the most representative uh, of all these peaks. For all the, uh, the most representative mo molecule for all these. All right, and the last one is the NMR question. So just asking the splitting and all that, uh, all that stuff. So let me just take a picture of the questions. All right. All uh, right. And this last one is in ultra pure conditions. All right. So first things first, um, I think she's asking for, oh, she doesn't even ask for the number of distinct protons. Well, I, I want to do that first. So what's the number of distinct protons here? Number of distinct protons that I have is, I have, I'm going to do it in a different color. So I have one, two, three. First things first, is this symmetric at all? I have this hydrogen next to this one, next to this one, this hydrogen is next to this, next to this, this hydrogen is next to this, and next to this. Everything is not symmetric whatsoever. Okay, at least on the benzene ring. So one, two, three, and then I move up to here. The CH2, is this, uh, this unique? Yeah, it's unique. This carbon with a hi one hydrogen, is that unique? Yes, it is. That's five. And then I have CH2, CH3, CH2, CH3. So only, you know, two of these, of these four are unique. So six, seven. Okay. All right. So six, seven. And then I have over here, I'm going to this side. So seven, this is unique. This is eight. And then I have over here, nine, right? This CH2. This OH is 10, and then I have 11, and this stereochemistry is, is unique, so 11 and 12. So I have 12 things, all right? And then uh, now I'm going to find the multiplicity of them. So the multiplicity of HA, multiplicity, let me read the instructions, actually. So what are the theoretically proved multiplicity? Uh, I have A, B, and C, all right, under ultra pure conditions. Oh, okay, for... Is the last one, it, this is for that, and this one is for C13. Uh, this proton's been coupled to C13 NMR. Okay, I need to go over that in another video. Um, this last one is C13. All right. Okay, so multiplicity of, is so this is regular, this is ultra pure, and then this is the C13. So multiplicity of HA, where's HA? So HA, what is multiplicity? It's number of distinct groups, and I'm trying to find uh, the n plus ones for each one and multiply them together if I can. So I only have uh, this carbon, I have only this one distinct group, so n plus one, so that's gonna be one plus one, two. Do I have any other carbons with hydrogens on them? So this carbon right here, but it has no hydrogen. So my answer is two for this, or double it, C. Multiplicity of HC, HC is this carbon right here, and it's next to two other ones, so these are not, uh, these are all, these are, each of these is unique. So this carbon right here has this hydrogen, so that's, that's two, so N plus one, so that's two, so one plus one, and then over here another one plus one. So I have two times two, it should be four. Let me just check. Right? Oh, multiplicity. Oh, okay. Oh, I was doing, yeah, yeah. Oops, C daisies. I just did HA, so this is 2B, and this one down here is 4. 
and then HB right here with this carbon right here. So I have to look at all the environments around it. So I have a CH2 group, so that's two plus one, right? That's that's distinct. And then I have this CH2 and these this CH2, and we just said that both of them are essentially six, and this is uh, seven. So these two are the same. So when I have similar environments, the same environments, I mean, uh, and I'm seeing like how they split something. I add them together because they are uh, they are the same type of environment. So this carbon is being split by these two hydrogens, and these two hydrogens are the same. So that means I add them together. So two plus two, that's four, plus one. All right. So I get three times five. That's fifteen. Okay. And then I'm looking at the multiplicity of HD, right? And I'm looking at that in ultra pure conditions. So HD is this one right here. And it's next to two hydrogens. So this should be three. All right, so triplet. And then I'm looking at the multiplicity of carbon E. Carbon E is right here. And essentially, I am looking at how when I'm it's C13 and uh C13 uh is the same exact kind of theory and, and method as uh, H uh, HNMR. So literally, I'm look except now instead of looking at uh, unique hydrogens, I'm looking at unique car uh, carbons. So I'm looking at is this carbon unique? Well, yes or no. So this this CH2 this carbon right here, I'm looking to the left. Is this carbon unique? Yes, it is. I'm gonna put a little check. Is this carbon right here unique? Yes, it is. I'm put a check. So I count I count the number of unique carbons that are nearby. So literally, it's just um, I'm counting them. So one, two. So two plus one. That's three. Right, and that would be the answer. And let's check. So three. Right. So it's literally just count the number of environments. And uh, wait for this one. Uh, number of environments, and you just add them together, and then you add one. Uh, one. Okay. So nothing too crazy, nothing too bad about that. All right, let's move on. Uh, finally, two reactions. And um, hopefully you guys are okay with this. I'm just going to be going through the key, uh, just talking about each one. First step is I have a vicinal syndiols. I have HiO4, so that's the high R. So I'm cutting the bond and I'm oxidizing each of these alcohol carbons into carbonyls. And then I have Na2CrO2 that looks like Cr or whatever, O7. Just for this is Jones. Uh, this is like the Jones-like one. So the chromate reaction, Na2CrO7. And so this is going to uh, turn um, the, uh, essentially, it's it's a oxidizer, and I already have carbonyls, but it's an oxidizer, and what that will do, that will just oxidize it even more. So I already have carbonyls, but I have hydrogens here, and that'll essentially turn those hydrogens into uh, alcohol, uh, the alcohol group, and turn these into carboxylic acids. And then the last step is I have carboxylic acid, and then um, I they're introducing alcohol and H plus, and so this last step is Fischer esterification, and I literally just add the alcohol group to each one of these. So the OCH2CH3, OCH2CH3 to the carbonyl. And that's pretty much it. You might want to look over that again on your own. It's a new, it's a newish reaction, but uh, nothing too bad. All right. Uh, the first step in this reaction is NaOH. So I have a strong base. NaOH is a stronger base than the, the phenol right here. Phenol is when you have a benzene ring with the OH attached to it. I know this phenol is a weaker is going to form a conjugate base that is um, not as strong as NOH because I, the phenol has resonance whereas the NOH the OH minus has no resonance so therefore this is the stronger base and it will deprotonate this and I will just get the pro, uh, deprotonated OR group and the second uh, part of the problem I have um, this looks like bromine, and this looks like a D for deuterium, and this looks like an H. And so I have a strong, um, I have a strong base, 
right? <sighs> Sorry, and I have a strong base, and I have um, a a a br. Okay, um, I don't think this is counted as bulky, um, because the oxygen is just uh so available out there. I don't think this is bulky. Um, otherwise, uh, it could have been bulky. Uh, but I don't think this is bulky. Clearly, if if it was bulky, it would this reaction would not have been able to happen, because uh, I cannot have bulky bases perform SN two. So this is the strong strong base acting as an SN two strong nucleophile only because of a primary uh primary uh alkyl halide. So the bromine, this carbon is only attached to one other carbon. So this is just SN two. And DMSO is here uh, also as well, so that's a hint that this is SN2. And all that happens is this comes and attacks. It's going to flip the stereochem, so this group should be on the 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 wedge, and then um, the 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 deuterium should move to the dash, and that's in the answer. Next part is H2O, and this looks like heat, and this is clearly a SN1 reaction of a tertiary alkyl halide. And so I have the SN1 product, right, which is the major. And then I have the E1 product, which is the minor. And notice how they didn't show any stereochemistry um, because it doesn't matter in this case. It was not shown before. It's not going to matter afterwards. It's already 50%, 50% racemic. Nothing special about really pointing that out. Okay. Um, all right, moving on. I have the first step is I have a double bond right here. I have BH three THF. Second step H two O two OH. So these are combined, and that's going to add an OH group to the least substituted carbon uh, on this molecule, and that's what I have in the first one. And then I have PACC, and that's going to form an aldehyde, and it's not going to fully oxidize it. Easy peasy. Next one is KMnO four warm concentrated. That's going to cut this double bond. It's going to turn these into uh, carbonyls and for the if for any of the double bonds that have hydrogens on them they will also get oxidized and so that's what we have over here and this carbon turned into a carboxylic acid this one right here turned into the ketone and then next up i have lialh4 then hto plus and this is a strong reducer and therefore it will reduce anything and everything that is a electrophile or a carbonyl in this case and it does not matter it does not need to be an aldehyde or a ketone it does not matter so both of them will get reduced to alcohols completely. And so that's what we have at the end of step two, alcohol and alcohol. And then in step three, you have bleach, NaOCl, which only oxidizes secondary alcohols into uh, to carbonyls. And so I have a primary alcohol, I have a secondary alcohol. So in the answer, you should only have this one as the carbonyl and this should be left alone. All right, simple enough. Uh, next one is HGSO4, H2SO4, H2O. And so what this is, um, this reaction is, uh, yes, HGSO4, HGSO4, uh, H2O. This is the um, reaction where I turn a triple bond um, into a uh, ketone always. Okay, so I, f I form the ketone as a symmetric molecule. So it doesn't matter if, if the person chose the left one over the right one. They are the same, okay? So both are equally likely, equally possible to happen, uh, and both form uh, the same type of molecule, okay, regardless. Next step is the acetylide anion, then HCl plus. So I have an electrophile, I have a nucleophile. I'm going to attack it. So that's what they just did, and then they protonated the O. So this came and attacked, and we have a, a bond here now to this carbon. And then they just wrote this group down here. That's the only difference. And then finally, the last step is H2PDBSO4 quinoline. This adds hydrogens and syn to the triple bond, turns it into a double bond. And that's what we have. We have this turned into the syn hydrogens over here. And then these whole groups went down. So all this is over here, all that's over there. This next reaction is KOH 200 degrees Celsius. This, for this forms the nearest internal triple bond. It has to come from either a vicinal or geminal uh, dihalide. Um, has to be di dibromide or dichloride, I believe. Um, and then that would be this one. So this is this triple bond, right? This is the closest internal tri triple bond. 
Next up is NaNH3, which adds hydrogens in trans to the triple bond. So that's what we have over here. Last step is CH2I2, ZnCu, which adds a CH2 in, uh, and forms cyclopropyl. And so this is the cyclopropyl. The groups that are in trans uh, that are on the same side are on the same uh, wedge or dash. So the H and CH3 are both on the same side. So they're both wedge and dash. And this and this are on the same side, so this, they're both wedge. First step over here is the Grignard, uh, and then uh, Grignard and ET2O. So this is the the ether with it. Um, and then I have H3O plus second step. <coughs> so the first step is attacking, and then I'm going to attack again because I have a leaving group that's attached to the carbonyl, and so I will have this. Okay. And then H2SO4 and heat and alcohol form the most substituted double bond, which will be the one that's right there. So therefore, I have these two CH3 groups, double bond, and then I have these two groups. And then the last step is MCVA, and that was one the epoxide. Okay. Um, there should be stereochem over here, but the reason why it's not shown is because we have two groups that are exactly the same. So it doesn't really matter whether I put this on wedge or dash. It's um, it's 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 uh, arbitrary, right? It's not gonna matter what you choose because it's not gonna it's not gonna change anything. One is always gonna be wedge, one's going to be dash. So they're, because they're two of the same, it doesn't matter. There's no chirality on that. And this one is TSCl, and that's going to form OTOS. So O becomes OTS, right? Um. Usually it's and there's another O, but this, this is also another way it could be written TSCL, not TS. Uh, uh, yes, it will not. Um, but I always have that other O. It's the same. It's the same thing. Uh, apologize for the yawning. And then I have NACN DMSO, and that's just so now I have a very good leaving group, right? And what you need to remember when you do the OTOS reaction is that it does not uh, re uh, invert the stereo chemistry. Okay, but you also need to remember that PBR3 does invert stereochemistry, so remember that. So I have, a good I have a good leaving group now. I have a strong nucleophile and the MSO to promote SN2. And so I'm just going to substitute the CN with the OTOS and flip the stereochemistry. So it's going to be on the dash and so on. Yeah, which... All right, so now enough of this crap. And um, let's do some mechanism. Okay. All right, this is going to suck, but um, let me just write this out. All right, so let me take a look at this. <clears throat> I have not looked at this before, so this is my first time doing this. Um, and it is your first time doing this, hopefully, maybe. Um, maybe you're just, you've done it before already, and you're just going over it with me. So I have a strong acid. I have a lot of heat. This will promote whatever reaction that is about to happen. Um, now I need to think about what I'm doing over here. So I need to think of, um, you know, obviously I'm using the acid to protonate one of these alcohols. And from there, I need to think how, what, what is the most effective way, um, for me to do this, that I can have, um, like ring expansion that's eventually going to happen over here. Okay, so I need to th I need to think very carefully, All right? So looking at the first first product, product A, and then product B, it looks like this carbonyl. Well, it's base. It's essentially this ring that expanded, right? I can I get, I can assume that, right? This cyclobutyl is still there, so I'm going to assume that this is the ring that um, expanded. And essentially, what it looks like in the answer key uh, is that she's basically in one time this this one got protonated, and the other time this one gets protonated. So we're just going to be careful here, and we'll just just watch me do it, and uh, we'll do this uh, one step at a time. So the form product A, I'm going to go in the direction of these electrons on this alcohol. Uh, oops, C Daisy. Taking that hydrogen and blah blah blah, and then I get stuck drawing this every time. 
All right. Okay, so I have this. Then I have that. And now I have a O H2 group. At this point, and it's positive, at this point I need to ask myself, is this capable of leaving on its own? And the answer is yes. It's only capable of leaving on its own, and this might have thrown people off on test two, I mean test three, when it's either secondary or tertiary. Both of these are acceptable times to leave on its own because uh, it will form a secondary or tertiary carbocation, which is perfectly acceptable, right? We do that in SN1 and E1 all the time. So I form this carbocation right here, and I'm bonded to this, this guy. Okay, I'm bonded to this guy. Maybe I should write bigger. <laughs> but um, I have a carbocation right there. And now I need to think about what I'm doing next. So what am I doing next? So I need to do a uh, ring expansion, I believe. Okay, so I need to expand my ring and I need to bring in this carbon right here. So what I'm going to think is I'm going to have, I'm going to, to draw a bond. Let me just actually make this all this bigger. All right, so what I'm going to do is we're going to draw a line out of this and I'm going to do ring expansion. All right, that's enough words. Ring expansion and essentially we're going to get our first structure. Okay. That's really ugly. All right. All right. So originally, what happened was I had this carbon right here. Um, that this line right here is this line. So I should probably number just for those of you that have trouble seeing how this ring expansion works. So I have carbon one, two, three, four five, then carbon six. So carbon five is now, I know this is carbon five and it's bonded to carbon six now. This is the new carbon six. Carbon six is bonded to carbon one, right? And carbon one, this is two, this is three, and this is four, all right? And on carbon one, we have this OH group. So this is how I know where everything is. Okay, oops, that's not a positive charge there. All right, and so what happened was I broke away from, I broke away from carbon one. That means that carbon one now has a positive charge on it. So I broke this bond and I bond it to six and I moved the carbocation from one, from six to one, right? That's essentially what I did, all right? And at this point, I have a resonance structure. So the uh, um, one of the lone pairs on the oxygen is going to resonate and it's going to fill that space. Okay. And essentially it's going to have this. All right, and that's what we have. So we have this resonance structure. And then to get to A, all I gotta do is either use H2O or OSO 3H minus. And I can use either of them to deprotonate this and give this its, uh, its electrons. And that's how I'll get A, okay? 
If I want to get B, essentially what we're going to be doing is the same thing over again, and I'm just going to be taking this uh, uh, this oxygen off first um, uh, in the mechanism. Okay, so it's the same exact thing. We're just going to uh, protonate this oxygen, and then um, this will leave, and then after that. Right, this will leave, and then I'll have ring expansion. Right, and this is how I will get two five member rings. So, this one expands to this one, and then the alcohol over here does the same thing where it becomes a carbonyl and it becomes the hydrogen. Uh, the hydrogen gets removed. So, let's see if I was right. So, it gets the first one. Right, so see how there's two arrows? See, I was correct. There's two arrows, and so, um. Sorry, there's a little bit of my ego coming out there. I was correct. Uh, so there's two arrows. Um, first one gets protonated, then it leaves on its own. We don't need anything to help it make uh, help make it leave. We have ring expansion. Then we have the resonance structure, so the double-headed arrow. That's one point. Make sure you have that. The brackets are not shown, though. Um, then we have the resonance, and then we have H2O or OSO3 deprotonating. Then we get A. And then it's the same shit over here. All right? Easy peasy. Now let's do our favorite part of the exam, synthesis. Okay, I've been waiting for this all vi all the whole all the video. I've been waiting for this moment. So, so, all right. This looks fun. The rules are: I have to go back to an alcohol of four carbons or less. That sounds daunting, but it's not that bad, honestly. Um, so it's really repetitive, and, and for the final. And the only thing that's really new that she's hope she's probably going to touch on is the formation of esters. And there's only one reaction that you guys know to have to form an ester. And that reaction is a carboxylic acid plus an alcohol in the presence of H+. Plus. And that will form an ester. It will merge this piece to this piece. And that is it. And so all I gotta do, all I gotta do is put in a little H plus and and I'll cut this. And what I'll go back to is I'll go back to this piece as the carboxylic acid and this piece as the alcohol. This whole thing will be the alcohol. And don't get confused that this oxygen uh, came from the carboxylic acid. This oxygen actually comes from the alcohol. So just as a conceptual piece, this, uh, this oxygen right here is part of the uh, original alcohol. So let's just get the two pieces. Wow, this is really ugly. All right, that's super ugly. Pissing me off. But um, we have that. And then I just have... Carbonyl, right? And it's just the carbonyl with one carbon and then uh, all right, maybe I made it too big, but um all right. Cool stuff. Now I'm gonna do the left side first because this is obviously super easy. This is just Jones, and then I just go back to Literally, that's like that's so easy, right? Just one, two carbons, one, two, and then alcohol. It's really easy. This is just Jones. On this side, it's a little bit more complicated, okay? As you can probably figure. So alcohols are my friends. So alcohol means I can cut things, and so I'm going to try and cut at the best best possible location, and so that would probably be right there, okay? And so I'm going to put then H3 plus at this arrow because I'm 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 adding a carbon group and so I'm I'm gonna be doing Grignard. So that means I'm going to have this piece. Okay, we have this piece as the MGBR. And then I'm going to have this piece in the bottom as As that, right? And so this will come and it will attack it, 
and that's how we have that bond there. So let's make this left side first because it's harder. I have MG, Ether, whatever. Okay. And then I have a, a bromine right there. Okay. Maybe I should just keep it consistent in the way that it looks. So I'm just going to draw it down. Okay, so I have that. All right. And now I need to I need to think a bit. I need to think. So I have one, two, three, four, five carbons. So I need to cut a little bit. And so I, I already know what to do. Okay. So my goal is to reduce this a bit. Okay, so I just move this up because I need some room. Just you know, bear with me. Um This starts from over here. All right. So my my strategy is I need to reduce the amount of carbons here. Now, can, what can I do really? What can I do? Should I go back to a double bond? Is that smart? Probably not. Should I go back to an alcohol? That might be that might be a good idea. So if I go back to an alcohol and so let me check something really quick. All right. So on this step, I can put PBR3, all right, and I can go back to an alcohol, a primary alcohol, so I can use PBR3 to do that, and then I can, from this, ooh, so what, I, what can I do over here? I can realize that I have a primary alcohol, and that means that I can put thin h 3 plus over here. And what I can do is I can turn this into, cut that right there, and make this side the greenyard. And then I'm going to make this over here, my friend, the epoxide, All right? So if I make this the epoxide, the greenyard is going to come with its three carbons, right? And attack right here. So I'm going to attack right here. This is going to pop off. I'm going to get that primary alcohol. And so this is very simple to do. So this is very nice for me. Mg and ether. And then I just get the Br. All right. And then from here again, I just do PBR3. All right. Do not do Br2 in light because that is not the major product if I do Br2 in light on this. And I just get the alcohol, three carbons, so this is fine, this is excess. And then over here, I need to get MCPBA. MCPBA, and that will go back to the double bond. All right. And then from this, I can have CH3. And then I can have, uh, bond it to a CH2. OH and on the arrow I can put H2SO4 and heat and this is excess so that's that was easy that was easy and then I have one two three four five so this is also going to be a pain in the ass um, so I need to make this one so the first step would be PCC And then from here, it's actually not that hard. It's just, just do Jones, right? Just do Jones. I mean, uh, my, my bad. I mean, just do a uh, Greenyard. <laughs> just do Greenyard. So then H3 plus. And then you would just cut right here or on the left side and we make one of them the carbonyl with the hydrogen. And then the other would be the Greenyard. So, you know. Like that. Okay, I'm sorry it's really messy. I'm doing this with my mouse. So, but I hope you can see what I'm doing. So verbally, what I'm saying out loud, at least. Um, so, th this sh you should know how to make this part. But this was the hardest part right here. All right? 
So you can pause or you can rewind and listen to me do it over again. Um, but this this should be enough for this part. And now my last and favorite part, the spectroscopy is the easiest. All right, here we go. So here's the spectroscopy. And I'm going to be doing this out loud at the moment. And um, all right, <laughs> so first things first is um, to, to do, uh, first things first is to uh, calculate the unsaturation number, right? So to make the unsaturation number, we have to just count the number of hydrogens, multiply them by two. So seven times two is 14. I add two to that, okay? And then I subtract the number of hydrogens. So 14, 16 minus 16, so that's already zero. And so zero divided by two is zero. All right, so my unsaturation number is zero, and so that's right, okay? Um, so easy peasy right there. And so that, that, that gives me some information that tells me I don't have any double bonds, no triple, uh, definitely no triple bonds, and I don't have any rings, right? So I just have a straight chain and just has, uh, I have an oxygen here. So this oxygen is almost undoubtedly either an alcohol or an ether, okay? No carbonyl. So now I'm gonna look to my spec. I'm looking at my spec and I see a, a pretty broad in the 3,000, 3,500, 3,400, wherever region. And this is going to tell me I have an OH group. This is my OH stretch, okay? I have nothing over here in the 1,600, nothing over here. This is just my 3,000 where my, you know, my sp3 hydrogens are. <clears throat> so I have an OH stretch. So this confirms I have an OH, okay? Now it's time to look at the spec, uh, the NMR. This is a proton NMR and this is the C13 NMR, okay? C13 NMR is basically freaking useless, okay? Uh, throughout the entirety of Orgo 2, you will have the C13 NMR on every exam, but <laughs> you will never really use it because it just, it just, it's, it's, it serves no purpose besides just letting you know how many distinct carbons um, you have. So it, it's pretty useless. Uh, there's only one thing that it's useful in doing, and that's indicating that you have a uh, ester. And I, I will talk about that in a separate video, um, but not this video. Okay, so I'm just gonna ignore this. I don't need it, okay? I'm gonna make this ugly and disgusting, because it is. All right, uh, so I'm gonna look at the NMR, and I'm going to see I have 6H, I have 1H, and I have uh, another, Let's see, uh, that's, uh, looks like another six, maybe it's nine H. Okay, maybe it's nine H. All right. Um, okay, so, all right. So I have six H, and so that tells me the integration number for this is referring to a uh, total of six hydrogens, and these, Six hydrogens are, you know, sharing the splitting of, of this environment right here, right? So I have 6H, and so that means typically I have CH3 groups that are symmetric. So that means I have typically two CH3 groups that are symmetric, and they're, they're coming off of the same thing, okay? And it's next to one peak, two peak, three peaks, four peaks. So it seems like it's coming off of a, another another CH3, which is not possible, okay? It's not possible for me, for two CH3s to come off of another CH3. This is just not possible, okay? So um, this, this structure is a little bit, there's something weird about these peaks right here. So one, two, three, um, four, four minus one is three. So, there, there's something weird about this, okay? Um, so I'm going to go on and I'm going to keep keep going. And I have a 1H, whenever you have a singlet 1H, you need to always be uh, skeptical. I need to think that, um, essentially this means a singlet, that means next to no hydrogens, but it has one hydrogen on itself. That means, that's always the OH. 
this is always the OH, okay? So this is always the alcohol peak. And then I have this 9H peak right here, but I believe. And so that's a total of nine hydrogens, and it's next to a CH2. So next to a CH2. Okay, so um, this is a this is a pretty tricky uh, spec problem, and it can be tricky sometimes. But you just have to like think through it, and obviously, you know, you will you will tell if you have the something that's a wrong answer. It's very easy to tell when you have a wrong answer. So first things first, we already said this is not possible, right? This is clearly not possible. So. To have CH3s that are next to another CH3, that doesn't really work. So, what needs to what I need to think is how is it possible? What like what kind of combination would nine uh, H com uh, be coming out to? So, like what can make a total of nine hydrogens? Well, I can't have a combination of both even and odd, right? Like, you know, this is clearly a symmetric molecule. Right, I only have two peaks corresponding to to car uh like carbons, right? So I have seven carbons that I have to somehow account for. So I know, you know, I have to some. There has to be some sort of symmetry here. There's no way there isn't symmetry because there's only two peaks. I have seven carbons, right? And I know I have symmetry already because I have these high these integration values that are higher than three, right? So six, nine. That means I have symmetry. So I need to be thinking symmetry. So 9H, I need to think that this can be, uh, you know, separated into three CH3 groups, right? Three times three. And then six, I need to think since I, I found three, this can be separated into three CH2 groups. And this kind of makes sense now. CH2, and honestly, this is, this is a pretty tricky uh, spec problem. So don't worry if you... First time around, you didn't get it, but it is it is pretty tricky, and it did take me some time to think about it. So CH two, and this is CH three. So these these obviously match up with each other. So this is a CH three next to a CH two, and we said this is some sort of you know six H next to a CH three, and this is the only way this is possible. That this is integration value is a uh, uh, corresponding to three CH two groups next to a CH three, and this is corresponding to Three, uh, three CH3 groups next to a CH2, right? So what our molecule should look like, it should look like this. And another, another good thing is that um, we should always remember that whenever I have a carbon that has hydrogens on it next to, uh, that ha uh, next to an oxygen, a bond to an oxygen, it, sh it should always show up in the four region, right? I don't have any peaks in the four region. So that tells me that Wherever my OH is bonded to, it's not bonded to anything that has hydrogens on it. So that kind of tells me that the carbon that is bonded to it is completely uh, fully bound. It's a, it's a tertiary carbon that has alcohol on it. So it has no hydrogens whatsoever, right? And so the only thing that my structure can be is CH2, CH3. CH2, see where I'm going with this, CH2, CH3. And so essentially I have this symmetric region. So these three CH2s all have the same chemistries. And so when I look at, okay, what's the multiplicity of this car, uh, these hydrogens right here? I'm looking at the adjacent carbon. So this carbon has no hydrogens, but this carbon has hydrogens. And so these hydrogens are splitting these CH2s. But how many hydrogens correspond to this multiplicity value? Six hydrogens correspond to this multiplicity value that is that, that is ca being caused by these CH3s, right? The CH3 hydrogens. So that's why it's six. And then I look at the CH3s. I look at the CH3s being, what's the multiplicity of it? It's being split by these two CH2s. So I have three peaks. And how many how many total hydrogens are represented by these three peaks? It's nine total hydrogens. So these three, these three, these three, that's nine. And that's where that multiplicity, that's where the integration value comes from. And that's where the peaks uh, come from. So it was a little bit tricky, but honestly, 
if you if you tried coming up with possible molecules, eventually I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you may not have gotten it the first time, you may not get it the second time. That's that's spec for you. It's not easy. So by the third time, you know, you're eventually going to get the right answer. You know, even if you have one thing that's off about your molecule, that's enough to completely throw it out. If I put the OH in the wrong position, or if I, you know, have a carbon carbon hydrogen environment that is not represented by the spec. And honestly, I was I kind of spoke too soon in, you know, saying the the C13 NMR is garbage. You know, I, I kind of take that back. Okay. Um, well, since I scribbled all over it, <laughs> but um, what you have over here, essentially it says only three types of carbon. So it would have been kind of helpful here. Um, one peak, two peaks, three peaks. C13 NMR, essentially it tells you how many unique carbons you have. And so how many unique carbons we have over here? We have one, two, three. That would have been a kind of a you know a decent hint. I didn't use the hint, but maybe that would have been easy and better for you if you you know were let's say running out of time and you didn't have any more time to think about other attempts. So that's the end for this video. Um, I'll try to do some more problems for spec. This is honestly one of the harder problems. Um, it just just. Now, I personally have not seen a problem like this in my whole whole time doing Orgo, where you have three symmetrical environments like this. Um, but get, get, if you can think, if you can have this problem in your mind as like some sort of reference, it's not. It's really hard for her to make anything kind of trip you up again in this way. Like you're you're aware of this now. You can kind of you can you're aware of how this, this structure can look and how other similar structures can look. Um, but yes, the final shouldn't be too bad. Just do do every single test that you can, every single reaction that you can, every single fax that you can. Make sure you are, um, you know, you you're comfortable with mass spectroscopy, the C thirteen NMR, um, the proton NMR, the IR, all of that. Make sure you're very comfortable with that. Those are free points. Um, Aside from that, the test should be pretty repetitive uh, along the uh, exams, and um, you know if you if you practice enough, you should be fine. It's pretty easy uh, to do very well on this final, and she typically doesn't make it very hard uh, after she makes the third exam extremely hard. So um, I wish you all the best of luck, and I will be trying to make some more videos. It's pretty late right now, so I probably won't make another one, but. Um, well, I'll try to make some more videos uh, as I can. All right? Um, best of luck.